Welcome to episode four of Real Health Radio. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Today on the podcast, we have an interview with Ari Witten. Um, Ari Witten is the best-selling author of the books Forever Fat Loss and The Low Carb Myth. He's a fat loss and metabolism specialist who focuses on hormonal rejuvenation and enhancement as a path to sort of effortless body transformation. Uh, Ari has a Bachelor of Science from San Diego University in Exercise Science with a specialization in fitness, nutrition, and health. He also holds two advanced certifications from the National Academy of Sports Science, and he's currently pursuing his PhD. Um, I became aware of Ari uh, last year when he released his book, uh, The Low Carb Myth. It's a book that I'd been sort of so wanting for so long. It basically kind of put everything together that I'd been saying, uh, saying to clients for kind of years, but just in this one very well-researched, well-put-together book. Um, so I was really wanting to chat with Ari and chat with him about that, as well as his approach to just sort of um, – Fat loss, which is one of his um, sort of areas of interest, but just general health. And he has some very, very sound, simple advice. And I think it's um, kind of very much flies in the face of a lot of the extremism that everyone likes to be kind of talking about. But it's really well researched. And I think he has a lot of very good sound ideas. So what we chat about today is we look at why he wrote The Low Carb Myth. And it's pretty uh, a pretty good story in terms of him kind of being very honest about the fact that what he'd been saying to his clients for the last 10 years prior to doing this had been wrong and really putting his hands up and being courageous enough to say, you know what, I was wrong and I need to then be doing something else about this. Um, We look at sort of what are the important factors in someone's diet and where people can go awry because they're focusing on the the wrong things. Um, One of the great things he talks about in the book is the myth about sort of being a fat burner and what this really means. So we kind of chat about that for a while. Um, We look at sort of the dangers of sitting and he's someone who's very much into getting people to be doing very gentle exercise, uh, a concept called NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And he talks about this in a lot of detail. And I think it's very good uh, common sense advice. And most people are going and doing really hardcore exercise when actually what he suggests would probably be your best first step. And then he looks at sort of the the kind of single biggest problem people have in terms of weight loss around their sort of mentality and thoughts around it. So it was a great interview. I love chatting with Ari. I think he's a really kind of switched on guy. He really knows what he's chatting about. So I hope you enjoy today's talk. So hi, Ari. Look, great to have you on the show. Um, to start off with, so why don't you just give us a little bit of sort of background on yourself and your story, sort of how did you get into health and how did you get into fitness? Uh, well, first of all, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically my background originally, well, I was sort of the typical teenager. Um, I would say somewhat nerdy teenager wanted to get better with girls wanted to have bigger muscles, wanted to have better abs. Um, you know, nothing, uh, particularly unusual. I didn't have any severe health problems or anything like that, that led to my, uh, getting interested in, in nutrition and fitness. Um, just wanted a little bit bigger muscles, but, uh, so I started basically with, uh, focus in bodybuilding and, uh, my older brother was a personal trainer his mentor was a professional bodybuilder. And so, you know, I kind of got into this field through that whole realm. And, uh, and so how old were you when, when that started out? About 13. Okay. And so I was heavily into that and, and, uh, just given my very, very obsessive personality, I mean, that's literally all I wanted to do. I, I just was cons- I was online. I was reading magazines. I was in forums, um, reading books. I mean, reading physiology textbooks, reading nutrition textbooks nonstop, basically from the time I was 13, 14 years old. Uh, then I went to college. 
and I went on to study exercise physiology in college um, and further, you know, uh, studied nutrition and, and that whole thing and still very much with a, f- a focus on more of the, the fitness, athletic performance, sure. bodybuilding type of thing. Um, and then for, uh, I would actually say that the biggest thing that started getting me more into the health side of things is that, uh, my dog got sick. Uh, my dog got severe arthritis. So I started playing with, um, things like, you know, anti-inflammatory herbs, turmeric, ginger, um, uh, curry powders and things like that. And, uh, glucosamine and chondroitin and all these, I got into that whole world of supplements. Yeah. Um, you know, started reading about canine nutrition and learned about, you know, Oh, canines are carnivores. They're not supposed to be eating, um, dog food pellets, you know, that are, that are made of corn and wheat and soy and whatever else they put into that. So I started feeding my dog, you know, raw beef and raw eggs and sardines and, you know, put all these herbs into it. And he literally went from a dog that could not move. And and I kid you not, this was a tough yellow lab hunting dog who he, he was so severely arthritic that he got to the point where he couldn't literally couldn't lie down or like bend down to drink water from his bowl. And I saw after doing that within about six weeks, he was transformed and literally he was moving and, and it was almost like watching him de-age. Like he, he started running around like a puppy again and he was able to move and lie down completely free of pain. I mean, literally for the rest of his life, uh, he didn't experience any joint pain whatsoever. And so, you know, that kind of made me see the power of nutrition and how it relates to health. And, and, and so I got, I went down that whole rabbit hole, um, (laughs) over many, many years and, and, uh, you know, did the thing that a lot of people do, which is they adopt all sorts of extreme diets and end up screwing up their health in the process of pursuing health. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I've basically continued the same obsession from the time that I was 13. Now I'm, uh, almost 32 and that's, that's kind of my story. It's just been almost two decades of obsession now. Okay. And so were you then working with, um, with other clients then in sort of your, your mid twenties or working in the, in the fitness industry? Uh, yeah, I, I was, I actually, sorry, I probably should have mentioned this, but I, I became a personal trainer in my early twenties, okay. uh, worked for many years as a trainer, um, went, you know, very in depth in terms of studying fitness and biomechanics and exercise physiology and, and, uh, furthered my, my education in nutrition during that whole time and applied it with all of my clients, obviously. Um, so yeah, I was very much in the, the actual experience of working with people one-on-one and applying all my methods and experimenting with all my radical new theories and making them my guinea pigs and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so look, earlier this year, you wrote a book called The Low Carb Myth, and it's probably my favorite health book of the last sort of year or two. Yeah, I've kind of recommended it to lots of clients. Um, it's one of the f- kind of first books that I'm, I'm recommending people at the moment. So why don't you just start out by saying, sort of telling us sort of what was the impetus for writing the book? Uh, well, the major impetus is that uh, I myself was sucked into the whole low carb paleo thing um, in my, my early 20s, actually. You know what? I actually started it when I was about 17. Um, I remember when I was a a junior in high school, I read a book called Natural Hormonal Enhancement by Rob Fagan, uh, which was one of the first books that was out there advocating a cyclical ketogenic diet. And, you know, I was I was the guy who was drinking cream and and uh, I mean, just consuming massive amounts of fat and convinced that carbohydrates were the devil and they were going to ruin all my hormones and. And that hormones were the key thing that's controlling everything when it comes to body composition. And, and so I went down that whole paleo, low-carb 
uh, rabbit hole and was convinced insulin was the devil. And, uh, and that's what I taught actually to my clients for many, many years. And, uh, you know, after about a decade of doing that, um, I realized, uh, first of all, I, I started to experience certain health problems. My hair started falling out. Uh, I started getting acne. I started feeling fatigued and I'm going, you know, I, I'm, I'm young. I'm in my mid twenties. Why am I experiencing these problems? So that was kind of one thing, especially, you know, I'm young. I'm, I'm the super health conscious guy. You know, I'm the guy who's known by all of my friends as the one who exercises so rigidly, who avoids alcohol, who doesn't do anything unhealthy, and yet I'm experiencing health problems. So, so what's going on there? That was kind of the first clue that something was off. Then I, I started reading um, works from various people that started making me doubt things. In particular, uh, Stephen Guionet, who's an obesity researcher, I started reading his sort of picking apart of Gary Tobbs's uh, carbohydrate theory of obesity. And when I read that, it was just, I mean, it, it, it was irrefutable. I mean, it's like, here's the facts laid down and I just had to accept, wow, I was wrong all of these years. The last decade, you know, everything that I thought controlled how fat you get. Uh, and you know, was the major scourge of, of health that I've been teaching all my clients about, you know, I was wrong. And, you know, I think when, when you're faced with information like that, you have sort of two choices. One is you, you sort of, you sort of look for ways to demonize the person presenting you with that information and then go on, you know, with your previous paradigms, or you just, you know, be, be strong enough to accept the fact that you were wrong. You were misguided. You maybe even misguided other people and led down them down a, a bad path that was, that may have ended up harming their health. And, um, and you try to learn and do better. And so, uh, I feel like a lot of people are doing that. A lot of people are in the same situation that I was where they, we're operating based on uh, a belief system that just doesn't have scientific support that has, I mean, just an unbelievable amount of holes in it. And so there's this big discrepancy between you have this very popular theory that so many people believe in and it's just wrong. You know, it's just flat out wrong. So I felt compelled to, you know, sort of break down in a very systematic way. Here's all of the holes in this theory. Here's why it's wrong. Here's why carbs and sugar and insulin are not the devil. And here's the actual science on it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, my major my major reason for wanting to do that was was really to just clear up misconceptions so people stop screwing up their health. Nice. And look, when I read through the book, it was great because it was a book that I was like, this is what I've been sort of telling people about, but I, I never really had something that I could just hand to someone and say, look, just read this. And so I'd be <laughs> able to answer their individual questions when they'd be asking me, but it just kind of really goes through sort of all of the different arguments and, and why um, they're not sort of so so true and, and kind of really picks it apart. And it was great because a lot of the people that you then reference um, are a, a lot of the, the blogs and the people that I follow. So, yeah, it was, it was lovely for that. Um, cool. And, I mean, Matt Stone is probably the guy who really sort of put me onto the whole sort of um, carbs aren't evil, and this was probably sort of five or maybe six years ago. Um, and so I've been sort of trying to get that message out as much as possible. I mean, I know there's probably lots of, of reasons, but why do you think sort of carbohydrates are so important for health? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not that I think carbohydrates are some magical nutrient that everyone should be basing their diet around and that they're critical to health. I think uh, they, they are critical to health, but, you know, I mean, there's, there are wide variations in diet that someone can have and still be healthy. 
Um, my major gripe is not that I'm advocating everyone to eat high carbohydrate diets. Yeah. It's, it's more the, the villainization of carbohydrates and sugars that doesn't have any basis in science that bothers me. Um, I think there's a pretty, pretty wide, uh, variation in terms of macronutrient content of the diet that you can exist healthily on. But what irks me is when you have all of these people out there saying carbohydrates are, are bad and, and then you have, you know, you look at the blue zones, you look at the world's healthiest, longest lived populations, and every one of those populations eats a carbohydrate based diet. Um, so, I mean, you can, you can get into the physiology of stuff like, you know, stored glycogen and, uh, exercise performance and how glucose is needed to power your cells and your brain and, and, uh, you know, better for thyroid health and all of this sort of stuff. Um, but I think probably the, the best argument is that the world's healthiest long lived populations all eat carbohydrate based diets. How is it? that carbohydrates could be harmful to us when that's the case. You understand what I mean? Yeah, totally. And look, I would say from, from what you said there is like my approach when working with people is very sort of non-dogmatic. And I, like yourself, went through a period of kind of believing that carbohydrates were bad and that people needed to to keep them low. Um, and I've now come to a, to a kind of a place where I'm like, you know what, whatever works for you, I'm really happy that that works for you. And it's not that I'm having to force everyone to go and eat a high carbohydrate diet. If having more amounts of fat in your diet works for you, then that's great. But it's about kind of working out what actually legitimately does work for you as opposed to kind of just blindly following the advice of, well, this is bad kind of in inverted commas and that you shouldn't be eating it. So yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's, and that's the key point is, is moving past all of this sort of the, the facade, the BS arguments out there around, Oh, this factor matters. That factor matters. The truth is that there isn't really strong evidence to suggest that macronutrient content of the diet is a major factor in health. Um, there, there, there really just isn't, uh, you know, there, there isn't any sort of correlation where we look to, you know, ex- we have these long-term experiments that consistently show that say a low carb diet is superior for health and longevity or a high carb diet is superior for health and longevity or a high protein diet is superior or a, a low protein diet. I mean, we, we just, there, there aren't any studies like that. Um, what the overall body of evidence pretty clearly shows is that macronutrient content of the diet does not matter that much in terms of, um, in in terms of health and longevity or body fatness. Um, and so if macronutrient content of the diet, which is really where most people have been fixated on for the last 30 years, um, if that's not the key, then, you know, my approach is going, okay, then, then what are the keys? What are the factors that do actually matter and do influence our health and our energy levels and our body composition? And so that's kind of where uh, most of my work focuses. Okay. Oh, look, what I would say, and this is through working with clients, is while I don't think macros or there isn't one perfect set of macros that everyone should live by, I do think that certain people find that they do better with certain things falling in certain ranges. So a particular person does a little better when they're having more amounts of carbohydrates or more amounts of fat or more amount of protein, and there might not be things across the board. Yeah, unquestionably that's the case. Yeah, Um, And it's to some extent determined by individual activity, but, you know, that's after you have – other principles in place. So uh, what I mean by that is food quality should come first, in my opinion. So food quality is addressed, and then you can focus on macronutrient uh, content of the diet. But if you're, again, in, in my opinion, if you're focused on looking at the actual macronutrient content of the diet and trying to find answers to health, energy, longevity, et cetera, um, in the macronutrient content of your diet, you're not going to find them there. 
Yeah. You may be able to take somebody who's currently on a very low carb diet and add carbs into their diet, regardless of source, regardless of whether it's donuts and you know cereal or uh, or uh, uh, potatoes and fruit, um, and they'll notice an improvement in their energy levels. Um, you know, and so yeah, there are macronutrient adjustments that you can make that can reliably make people feel better, but I think. In my opinion, a focus on macronutrients like the, you know, the either the low carb people, the low fat people, or the, the if it fits your macros people. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, they're they're largely missing the point of sort of the more important factors. Oh, totally. And I would say when I get to that stage, it's only because we're doing the foundational stuff right. So it's right. like I know you're eating often enough to support your body because we've worked that stuff out. I know that you're sort of having carbs, proteins, and fats with each of your meals. We've started to work out what are the carbs and the proteins and fats you do better on. So there's right. already a whole heap of information, and it's then just kind of taking that to another level where it's like, let's see if we can get some extra mileage out of this. So, yeah, like that's definitely a big part of what I'm doing with people. And I think a lot of people really mistake this is they they try and do some very, very advanced stuff that is going to add maybe like 1% or 2% without doing the really obvious big stuff, which makes all of the difference. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's great. As, as, as long as you're doing it in that order, then you have things dialed in. Yeah. And I think that is an important first step for people is like, you, you've got to make sure you're eating enough calories. You've got to make sure you're, as you said, having good quality food. And by good quality food, I also mean like foods that people can digest. So it's not in absolute terms. It's like what works for that person's body. Sure. Yeah. And in that sense, I mean, the, in terms of macros, um, the truth is that very few people actually do well uh, on a high, higher fat diet and a very low carb diet as opposed to a more moderate diet. Yeah. And, and that's, I would say, again, when I'm shifting people between macros, it's within a sort of a fairly moderate range. There is no point where we're getting into a stage where we're like keeping fat at 70 or 80 percent and then you're keeping the others really low. It's always right. within a fairly kind of 10 uh, percent and 20 percent like ups and downs of, of all of them. So, yeah, cool. it, nothing too extreme. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's important for everyone to kind of experiment I would say within a, a, a balanced macronutrient profile to, ex, to play around with, with ratios a little bit and as well as sources of those macronutrients and figure out, you know, what makes them feel best. And, and there definitely is some individual variability there that uh, transcends any sort of one size fits all solution. Yeah. And I also getting out of the habit of like, making making decisions based on what you've read or what you think is going to be the case and really kind of tuning into your body and, and seeing what it prefers because for a lot it's of people so they they discover that they actually do do really well on white potatoes but not so great on sweet potatoes despite yeah. the fact that everyone raves about how amazing sweet potatoes are right yeah it's so it's that that line between you know differentiating between is this something that I'm doing or that I think makes me feel good because I've been taught to believe this thing is good yeah. or bad, or is it genuinely, you know, I'm just tuning into the, you know, objectively real uh, reactions of my body. And that, that line is very blurry, you know, for some people, especially, I mean, people who are more sort of type A, obsessive compulsive in their head constantly, they really have that those issues of like, this food is terrible for me. And if I have one bite of it, it'll cause my fat to explode. And I mean, uh, differentiating between those lines of being able to tune into your body versus, you know, what your, your belief systems around food are telling you, it's very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. And I guess I think probably again, starting with the more obvious stuff where you're just like, you know what, I'm not caring so much about the individual foods, but let's see what happens when you're having carbs, proteins and fats at each meal. Or let's see what happens when you're having something to eat every five hours as opposed to every three hours or vice versa. So right. you're, you're kind of doing really big 
bigger obvious things that people are more likely to be able to differentiate from and the more that they start to tune that stuff in then the more that you can start getting into the things that are going to be a little bit more specific or a little bit more difficult to differentiate between yeah absolutely and so one of the parts of the book that I really liked was you talking about um, the difference between sort of burning fat and burning body fat. And I think this is a concept that most people um, that I speak to really sort of miss the point on. So are you able to just kind of explain that a little bit? Yeah, I, I um, that one's very personal for me uh, because I, I, I feel a lot of people are just being duped. Uh, really in, in a very shady, scammy sort of way where people are out there and, and they understand the difference between these two things, but people are intentionally stating things in a very misleading way to confuse people and to scam them out of their money. Um, and this difference between being a, a fat burner or burning body fat is a very big distinction. Um, but when you go into low carb circles and you start seeing people advocating low carb, high fat diets, almost everyone in that realm talks about being a fat burner as opposed to a sugar burner. And then they intentionally conflate that idea, this concept of being a fat burner with actually burning body fat off your body. And these are, these are totally two two totally different concepts that have no relationship to one another. But because of basically the semantics of it, that we talk about those two things in the same, using the same phrase, we, whether we're eating a high fat diet and a, we're a fat burner because we're eating a high fat diet, we say we're burning fat. And whether we are in a state of caloric you know, deprivation, uh, we're in a deficit where we are having to tap into our body fat stores and burn off body fat. We call that, you know, bur- being a fat burner. So we're, we're burning fat, you know, so a big part of the issue is just semantic confusion because we use the same phrase to describe both things. But basically the difference is this. Um, if you talk about someone on a 2000 calorie diet and you put one of those people on, let's say a very high carb, low fat vegan diet. And you put the other person on a extremely low carb, high fat diet. Okay. And both in both cases, the person's burning 2000 calories on both of those two different diets. They're burning 1500. They're uh, consuming 1500 calories. Okay. So if I, if I misstated, they're consuming 1500 calories, burning 2000. Yeah. Okay. So in both cases, they have a 500 calorie deficit. Yeah. The question is how much does the sugar burner lose? How much body fat does the sugar burner lose? And how much body fat does the low carb fat burner guy lose? And the answer is They both lose exactly the same amount of body fat. And we've actually done those experiments in in metabolic ward studies, and we have that answer. So we know that this is the case. Okay. So the caloric deficit is what determines how much body fat is lost, not whether you are a fat burner on a low carb, high fat diet, or a sugar burner on a high carb vegan or other high carb mixed diet. So essentially, being a fat burner as a result of eating a low-carb, high-fat diet means nothing. It doesn't influence how much body fat is burned in any significant way. And uh, it's, it's a meaningless concept that is used only to scam people out of their money. Yeah, and look, I think that was sort of explained really well and really well in the book. Um, 
And it's so often that I speak to people and they're, and they're talking about, oh, I, I want to put this guy on a, a ketogenic diet because it's going to help because he's then going to be more of a fat burner. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that explanation is a, is a really good one. I mean, you just sort of touched on calories. So, it's like, give me your stance on calories because you've got so many people that are about sort of it's all about calories in versus calories out, while there's others that are like calories are totally around relevant so kind of give me your your opinion on on calories uh well in in my opinion both of those people are wrong (laughs) um (laughs) that's the simple answer they're wrong for different reasons though um so the people who say calories in calories out doesn't matter calories don't matter uh anyone who says that is scientifically ignorant and that's just that's just a fact Those people have to deal with it. They don't know what they're talking about. They need to wisen up and actually read the scientific literature. End of story. Anyone who says that is not worth having a dialogue with. And that's harsh. Maybe someone who uh, is listening to this, who, you know, uh, who thinks that way, thinks, oh, you know, they're they're probably saying, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because I read so-and-so that said calories don't matter. Well, that person doesn't know what they're talking about either. Um, calories in calories out absolutely does matter. There's an overwhelming body of thousands of studies that prove that calories matter. And, uh, the fact that anyone would even broach that, that discussion is, is, is a sign that they haven't read enough of the scientific literature. Um, now the other problem is the people that talk about things from a very reductionist perspective and say calories in calories out. It's just as simple as that. That means all you have to do to lose fat is just eat less calories and, and, and burn more, you know, do more exercise. And the problem with that is that when you tell people to do that, it's remarkably ineffective in terms of a long-term approach to fat loss. And the reason for that is because that that way of thinking about it, that way of conceptualizing the calories in, calories out equation presumes that calories in, calories out is mostly based on conscious decisions. And it's not. It's not based on conscious decisions at all. It's largely dictated by the food quality of your diet, uh, specifically reward and palatability, uh, as well as variety of your diet. That's going to determine how much you physiologically are driven to eat each day. So literally how much hunger and satiety you feel and thus how much food you end up consuming, how many calories you end up consuming. And that's not a process that's dictated just by a person's conscious decisions. Oh, I'd like to eat, you know, 1800 calories today. It's dictated unconsciously by a person's hunger and satiety cues. Um, and so that that's influenced by mostly dietary quality. Um, the other thing that's influencing it is movement habits and sitting habits. So we know, for example, that, and this is very counterintuitive, but if a person sits all day, uh, their appetite goes up. Okay. So it, it it's counterintuitive in the sense that you, you would think normally that if you're more active, that your body would crave to eat more as a result of you expending more energy. Well, sitting creates, creates this unique effect where you're totally inactive, expending almost no calories. And yet for some reason, it actually stimulates your appetite and causes you to eat more than if you were standing or moving your body and burning more calories. Um, so, you know, how you move your body during the day influences the calories in, calories out equation. Then you have circadian rhythm and light exposure patterns, which have a massive effect on, on both the calories in and calories outside of the equation. It'll screw up your metabolic function if you have disrupted circadian rhythm or sleep deprivation, um, which lowers the calories outside of the equation. It'll slow resting metabolic rate. And more importantly, it will uh, decrease your desire for spontaneous movement for what's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is hundreds and hundreds of calories each day, um, just as a result of these spontaneous little movements that we do during the day. 
Then the other thing that, that circadian rhythm, disrupted circadian rhythm will do is stimulate appetite centers of the brain. And specifically, it will cause you to seek out highly rewarding junk food, which going back to that first factor I mentioned is also going to further cause you to want to eat more. Um, so you have all of these factors basically going on that have nothing to do with a person's conscious decisions around how many calories they're going to eat each day or how many times they're going to go to the gym each week that are actually the major forces that are dictating that calories in calories out equation. And so that's where, so, so calories in calories out does matter, but it's not just a simple matter of your con conscious decisions. It's a matter of addressing those factors that influence your physiology and influence that uh, calories in, calories out equation outside of your awareness. Yeah. And look, I think that's a, a very good detailed answer, which whenever people ask me, it's like, yeah, I do agree with calories in versus calories out, but it's never as simple as the way that most people talk about it. And right. that most of the equation is outside of your conscious control. And so much of people's, in terms of, say, the calories out, is that they like think, if I just add some extra exercise on top of this, that sort of bumps it up. But my kind of bare bones minimum is always going to stay the same without realizing that there's actually a lot of things that you can be doing where you're going to be pulling down the output that your body chooses to use. Yeah. And I think and, and exercise can be counterproductive too. If someone starts doing too much exercise, um, they may get fatigued and then you get a drop in, you know, a compensatory drop, drop in, uh, in neat. Um, so you're, you go to the gym more, but then you actually unconsciously, you start moving your body less the rest of the day that you're outside of the gym, yeah. um, because you're tired from working out. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of subtleties there and a lot of ways that people can get themselves in trouble and expend lots of energy and suffer without getting much result. Yeah. And I think the the big thing I'm always kind of encouraging people uh, to kind of think about is like the body or your body is constantly adapting to the outside environment and it's wanting to do the best at sort of keeping you alive. And if you're doing things that are really harsh in terms of restricting food or doing lots of energy um, sapping exercise and you're not giving the body what it needs to really support that, it's going to just start turning down and turning off other functions because it's like we just don't have the resources. And so in the short term, yeah, you may see some benefits, but long term, all of that weight and all of those things will sort of start to, to kind of uh, come unstuck. Absolutely right. Yeah. And so, I mean, kind of going on from that, like when I sort of follow your Facebook page, I see a lot of what you kind of suggest is sort of people making sort of small changes and creating uh, sort of daily habits. I'm a big fan. I don't know if you know James Clear and his blog, and he kind of promotes a sort of very similar idea of sort of creating really easy habits. Um, mm -hmm. And I know personally, like... Um, Often clients can know something intellectually, but it's a different sort of uh, situation in terms of putting into practice. So kind of talk about sort of how people can be sort of creating sort of healthy habits and if you've got any tips that they can then be implementing. You know, ha habit creation, there's a lot of um, books on that topic and a lot of people talking about it these days and talking about hacking your habits uh, habits really come down to, and that initial period, a lot of it just comes down to the simple stuff of actually doing the new habit, stopping the old habit, doing the new habit, and then doing that consistently for a period of time, whether it's 30 days or 60 days or 80 days or whatever, until it gets to the point where that's neurologically wired in. And, and that's just a fact, you know, I mean, you just have to do it. There's no, there's no trick. There's no workaround that allows you to not exert any effort or willpower to change your habits with perfect ease and, and no effort. Um, you actually do have to, to do the new skill, the new habit. Um, and, and there's a lot of individual variation around this. Personally, I've always been a very extreme personality. So, uh, when I, 
when you, when you talk about, you know, you can get some benefit from doing this certain thing, my mind immediately goes, okay, what's the most extreme place that I can take that? You know, yeah. how, how can I implement that 100% perfectly tomorrow? Um, and, uh, for me, a big learning curve was realizing that a lot of other people don't work like that. Um, yeah. people, people go, Oh, well, you know, that sounds nice, but I just can't do that. It it doesn't fit within my current routine. And for a long time, I just, I couldn't understand that mentality. I'm like, I'm showing you something that can improve your health. Why would you not do it to the fullest extreme that's possible? And, and, you know, a lot of people just depending on their personality, they don't. So you have to go, okay, well, let's break this down in the steps. Can you do 5% of what I'm talking about? You know, you don't have to walk 15 miles every day, but maybe you can stand up from your desk and move your body for 25 seconds once every couple hours. Is that too much for you? You know, and so you, you, you break things down until you get to a point where that person says, oh, OK, I can do that. And then, you know, and then it's a matter of actually doing that. Once, once you get to that level where the person doesn't have any serious objection to it and it doesn't seem totally unreasonable to them, apply that. Okay. Once you've applied that for 30 days or 60 days, let's take it a step further, you know, and let's take it a step further. And, uh, yeah, it really is. It's pretty simple. I don't do anything particularly fancy. I would say the fanciness of what I do lies less in having some magical tricks as far as habit formation and more in an analysis of what are the specific habits that are going to be the most beneficial. Okay. And I, I would agree with all of that. And there is always an initial stage where it is hard and it does take more effort to make changes than to be doing the, the way that you've always done it. Um, I think some of the issues lie with people where after a certain point, your new habit should be something that is fairly easy to do without willpower. And I've I've kind of talked about this before on my blog, like I don't wake up every morning and tell myself I have to eat healthy or I'm eating this because it's healthy or I'm going to go walk the dog for two hours a day because it's healthy. I just do those things because they're part of my everyday life. Absolutely. And, and once you do it, once you get to that point of doing it and depending on the habit, it different, it differs in terms of the amount of days that it takes to get to this point, but whether it's 30 days or 65 days or 90 days or whatever, you get to that point of neurological automaticity. And, and literally what that means is that then becomes easier to do the new habit than it is to do the old habit. And, and it, yeah, like you're talking about there, it doesn't require willpower for the rest of your life. It requires an initial period of willpower to build in that habit neurologically and make it automatic. And then it's automatic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I find is too many people are doing things that like a year, two years down the line, it's still taking an inordinate amount of willpower to be doing it each day. And you're like, okay, if that is the case, there's something that's gone awry. You're asking too much of your body as part of this, or you've changed too many things all at once, or there is no point that you're going to ever be able to do this because of how extreme you've taken this. And I, yeah. I think people really need to to realize that, that I think being healthy after you get past a certain point is actually not very difficult at all. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, they, they, they look at something, something about the way I'm eating or the way I'm living and they, they say something to the effect of, you know, doesn't that require a lot of willpower? I don't know how you, you are able to, to do that it must require so much, you know, internal motivation and willpower to, to resist that temptation or to do this thing or whatever. And, uh, and I just, I look at them almost bewildered because I'm, I'm like, it, it, it really doesn't. Um, it doesn't require enormous reserves of willpower. I do this as automatically and effortlessly as you don't do it. Um, because that's what habits are. You know, you, you get to a point where it's automatic and it, that's just the way that your life is. You, every night before bed, you brush your teeth. That's the way it is. 
somebody who has never brushed their teeth all their life, you know, might find that, you know, look at that and say, oh, that must require a lot of willpower to remember to brush your teeth every night. You know, well, it it really doesn't. It's just a habit. You just do it every day because that's what you do and you don't even think about it. So another area that you talk a lot about in the book and also you've sort of mentioned is around sort of movement and exercise. Um, And a lot of what you kind of talk about is that in the beginning, most people would be much more beneficial with just kind of standing or walking or doing very simple things as opposed to sort of hitting at the gym or doing a boot camp or kind of more strenuous exercise. So kind of explain this um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, well, there's, there's a few aspects of it, but, um, one of the biggest things is that sitting and having flaccid muscles that are inactive for long periods of the day is, is fundamentally bad for your health. It's bad for your longevity. It's bad for your metabolic health. It's bad for your, uh, energy level. It's bad for your hormonal, le- le- uh, hormonal health, every aspect of, of doing that is simply bad for you. So the first thing is get up from your chair and find ways to move your muscles a little bit. You don't have to do intense exercise. You don't have to do anything strenuous, but you do have to just move your body. Like right, right now, even though you can't see me, I'm waving my hands in the air as I'm, as I'm talking to you, you know, I'm making hand gestures as I, as I'm speaking little movements. It's not, it's not about doing anything exhausting. It's just about having a little bit of movement in your day, which unfortunately in our modern world is, is now a novel thing. You know, I mean, movement used to be even just 50 years ago or 60 years ago, it it used to be a a fundamental part of everyone's day. Um, and now with the rise of electronics and the internet and computers, Uh, We have a lot of people who just sit and don't move their bodies for 10 or 15 hours a day. And it causes really major problems, one of which is fatigue. So the problem with telling someone to, you know, to move more and then say, go to the gym more and do more high intensity exercise is that that oftentimes if you're dealing with someone who's not metabolically healthy, will cause even more fatigue in an already fatigued person, which will lead to even less movement outside of the gym. So do you you follow all that so far? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So then if you add in the fact that we know that uh, if you compare, what do they call them, Uh, a lazy exerciser versus an active couch potato. And what that means is, Someone who exercises at the gym consistently, but who is fairly sedentary outside of that versus someone who doesn't go to the gym, doesn't do any formal exercise, but has um, activities of their daily life. Um, Let's say they're a maid, for example, and they're vacuuming people's houses or dusting or or whatever. Um, Gentle movement throughout the day. The the, uh, active couch potato is far more metabolically healthy than the lazy exerciser. Okay. So that's why I say the first principle is move more with lots of gentle movement, make efforts to inject some movement into your daily life, stand up more, sit less. And as a result of that, that's the fundamental improvement in metabolic health it's going to improve your energy levels. It's going to help you regulate your appetite normally, et cetera. Okay. From there, then you can worry about doing exercise. But if you get things backwards there and you start worrying about the exercise first, you can get yourself into a heap of trouble. Yeah. And what I find about that kind of advice and a lot of the other stuff you talked about is it's very sort of unsexy. Like it's easy to sell a boot camp. It's easy to sell like extreme exercise and extreme makeovers and all of that. 
and it's very difficult to sell, you know what, you should just do a little bit more standing or you should do a little bit more walking or you should take yourself to bed a little earlier. Like people don't believe that that's going to work and it, it almost becomes that that is so outlandish because it's so, um, it's too simple or it's too common sense. Yeah, and and it is. I think the, the way that I like to sell it is, you know, to, to get people to conceptualize it and to really make an impact is to basically say, if you don't do things this way, if you focus on just the exercise and you do things backwards, you're doing something that may very well be counterproductive. And if you, if you conceptualize it that way, if you conceptualize, here's the foundation, then you go do the boot camps and the CrossFit and the intervals and whatever. Yeah. Um, that's the right way to do things. That's the way to have good metabolic health, good energy levels and improve your body composition. Um, the way of worrying about the intervals and the CrossFit and the, and the, uh, boot camps first is going to make you a beast in the gym and it's going to make you a sloth out of the gym, you know, and, and, and you really, uh, as, as unsexy as gentle movement is, it's more important than the exercise that you're doing. Yeah. And look, I, I, 100% agree with that and just getting people to do very simple things can have such an impact and I'm I'm incredibly lucky I work from home most of the time I have a dog so I'm walking anywhere from sort of an hour and a half to two hours a day um, nice. every single day and it's just that very gentle thing that it helps from a kind of cardiovascular perspective, but also helps getting out, getting sunlight, um, getting me away from looking at a computer, getting me out in nature, allowing me to, th- to kind of think my thoughts, all of those things. Um, that is just so important that we, we now miss in this day and age, whereas people go to the gym, they put on an iPod, they work themselves into the ground for half an hour, two hours, whatever it may be, and then they come home and then that's it. Yeah. And, and the reality is, if, if you look at things from the perspective of, of traditional populations, like, for example, I saw a uh, documentary recently on the Tara Humara Indians, who are, uh, are you familiar with that tribe? I am not, no. Okay, so they're a group in the, in the Copper Mountains of Mexico. Um, and these people, if you, if you look at the way they live, if you just observe their movement patterns, um, pretty much constantly throughout the day, they're doing something, whether it's, you know, plow- tilling the fields for gardening or shoveling or picking up rocks and moving them from one place to another, or, you know, the women, the women, uh, using stones to grind up corn into flour, um, hauling water from, from the Creek several miles away. I mean, there's, there's always something that needs to be done throughout the day. Uh, and, and we're not talking about them doing exercise for, you know, a a 45 minute intense workout or an hour long workout or something like that. We're talking about these people moving their bodies pretty constantly for 10 hours a day, you know? And so when people, you know, you have all these marketing programs, get results in just 15 minutes, you know, three times a week or you know, yeah. only requires a 30 minute workout, you know, <laughs> four days a week, whatever it is. I mean, which, which to some people actually seems like a lot of activity if they're extremely sedentary already. The reality is what most traditional humans, what our, what our ancestors have been doing for thousands of years is moving their body pretty much most of the day. And, uh, you know, doing a little hour workout a few days a week really is not very much when you consider it in that context. Yeah. And it, it is those kind of little changes where you're making, as you say, more, more movement that really make all the difference. And I, I kind of think this comes back again to sort of the, the habit stuff that we were talking about that often people are wanting this one big 
overarching change that they can make that is going to solve everything. And probably, again, coming back to why people want a low-carb diet is that it's if I can just do this one thing, then everything is sort of magically repaired and it's just going to happen overnight. And they kind of disregard the, the little things. And so often you'll speak to someone and you'll be like, you know what, if you, if you follow this through for sort of the next couple of years, you're going to notice so many different, like so many benefits. And they're like, two years, there's no way I want to do this for two years. And then you, you, you speak to them in two years and what they've done is they've gone on this diet and that diet and right. this other thing. And at the end of those two years, they're in the same place they were before or worse yeah. Uh, whereas if they just done some of the the kind of the simple stuff, um, they'd be in such so much of a better place. Yeah, absolutely. And and the the single biggest problem in terms of uh, mentality as it relates to fat loss is that people are looking for a quick fix. People think about losing fat in the context of how can I adopt adopt something for the next two weeks, you know, how can I adopt so-and-so two week juice cleanse or how can I adopt this 30 day or 60 day diet? And then I, and then I'm going to lose those 20 pounds. And then after that, uh, the, the pounds are lost, they've gone away. And then I can go back to my normal routine. And that way of thinking about things, that whole mentality is a curse that will lead to nowhere. Um, it, it will lead only to, to needless pain and suffering that in the long term will not net any positive result. In fact, it will only net negative results. Um, the, the right mentality to approach fat loss from is to realize that the best way to keep fat off is to keep doing whatever led to the fat loss in the first place. And that only can be done if the thing that led to the, the fat loss in the first place is something that is sustainable and healthy. Yeah. Um, and if you adopt, you know, a 10 day juice cleanse, I mean, are you going to six months from now, are you still going to be on that juice cleanse where you're eating nothing but, but green juices? Um, are you still going to be eating less than 50 grams of carbs per day and avoiding all bread and sugar and potatoes and fruit like it's the plague? Um, you know, when, when you talk about that kind of extreme approach, you're talking about something that's worthless. It's not going to lead to anything. Um, so the right focus needs to be how, if, if you understand that, if you understand that the only thing that's going to be effective six months from now or two years from now is something that is first of all, effective for fat loss Second of all, makes me feel good instead of bad. And third of all, is, is sustainable, is not so extreme that it can actually be maintained for that long. And I continue, and two years from now, I can actually do it every day the same way that I'm doing it today. And if you're talking about an approach that doesn't meet those criteria, it's worthless. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm always kind of talking about when I'm working with clients is that like what we're doing and the changes we're making, this is what you're then going to keep up for the rest of your life. It's not right. that you keep it up while we're working together. And if it at any point feels like it's unsustainable, then we've changed too much too quickly or we need to be revising things because that sort of unsustainability um, is just not a good place to be. And as you said, you need to be able to then keep it up. And so Absolutely. for me, I work with a lot of people who've kind of taken the sort of healthy eating thing too far and sort of what started out as, say, something fairly positive has now become sort of an obsession and their health has really started to start to suffer. And when I'm working with these people, my focus is much more on getting them to relax around food and not have it be such a huge worry and a focal point in their life. I mean, is this something that you've come across with people? And sort of if so, how do you deal with it? Uh, I definitely have come across it. Um, I generally, I mean, if somebody has severe, a severely damaged psychological or emotional relationship with food, I generally refer them out. Um, because that's, that's not where I'm best. You know, I, I that requires one-on-one -on -one 
work together. It requires, you know, sort of normalizing a person's emotional relationship with food. And it's a very individual thing, depending on the person's particular kind of, uh, of disturbed relationship with food and their personality and so on. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't necessarily like to work with that kind of, of situation. Um, but, uh, in terms of the way that I present my work, uh, I, I specifically avoid demonizing any type of food. Um, I, I just feel like the, let me put it this way. The, the way, what I've noticed is that oftentimes the stress that someone will create over eating any particular food is worse than the food itself. Yeah. And so I feel like demonizing foods, even though it may be beneficial for some people, it certainly causes as much harm as it does good. And the way I present my work is I ask people to focus on seeking out higher quality sources of nutrition. And, and I don't specifically outline, here's all the bad ones, here's all the good ones. I just say, here are the principles of what a healthy diet or healthy lifestyle habits look like. Move towards that in the best way that you can, in the way that seems appropriate to you. But the, the paradigm, the, the mentality should not be about avoiding so-and-so bad, harmful things. It should be about seeking out better things, seeking out the good stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and I find that a lot of people who, who come from really emotionally screwed up relationships with food really appreciate that perspective. They, it, it, it creates a big shift for them because they've been living for so many years around this paradigm of avoidance of all the stuff that is going to be harmful. And then if they do indulge, then they feel really guilty about it. And it's just, it's a paradigm shift to go, Oh, I don't have to live in fear of all the bad stuff. I can just focus on doing my best to focus on the good stuff. Yeah. And look, I sort of always tell people like there are there are no inherently bad foods. And I and I honestly mean that. Um, there are better and there are worse foods, but there is nothing that you can eat that is in that kind of one time consuming it is going to cause problems. And I would say there's also no inherently good food where you can eat it ad nauseum and it's not going to then cause some issues at some threshold. Except for Krispy Kreme. Be pardon? Except for Krispy Kreme. I'm pretty (laughs) sure that you can eat Krispy Kreme as much as you want and it'll never cause any problem. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, yeah, it is very much then – because once you can then diffuse food and have that not be a power – over you it's at then at that stage that you can then reflect on okay well what does genuinely work for me right. um whereas if you're constantly worried about i shouldn't eat this it's bad um it's amazing how much you more you want those specific foods and how much more difficult it is to avoid them and when right. they're on the menu and you can have them whenever you want you're like you know what i'm kind of over them right and and the challenge the big challenge here is you know, if, if you're working with someone who's underweight or anorexic and is on some incredibly restrictive diet, uh, then it's it's really easy, you know, to I mean, in terms of the actual person getting over their issues, that's one thing. But it's easy to as far as what you do as the practitioner to help them, you unrestrict your diet, you know, and and don't focus on demonizing so much foods and, you know, eat all the stuff that you thought you couldn't eat before, et cetera and eat more and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it will reliably produce beneficial results and and help that person. The challenge is when you're working with someone who's overweight and you want them to lose weight, you know, uh, or they, they're trying to lose weight, I should say. And, uh, you also don't want them to, to get into some, trap of orthorexia and, you know, disordered relationships with, with food. Um, so how do you balance, you know, the, the issue of not telling anybody any type of food is bad and they can eat whatever kinds of foods they want, um, while also achieving fat loss. And, and that's, you know, there, there's definitely a, a balance that needs to be 
gotten there. Um, you can't have things both way where you, both ways where you tell people you can have as much as you want of whatever kinds of foods you want and you can achieve fat loss. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I guess yeah. for me, the approach is then look, you can have whatever foods do you want, but I want you to pay attention to how you feel when you eat those different things, what happens in terms of your cycle, your sleep, your energy, your mood, so that right. people then can start to make that connection between, you know what, when I have that, it doesn't do so well for me. It's not mm -hmm. that it's kind of bad in inverted commas. I just don't do so well when I eat it. And right. that's then getting away from sort of absolutes and getting someone much more in tune with their own body. Um, so, yeah, not not always the easiest thing to do, but that's kind of the, the way that I approach it. Definitely. And I think that's a great way of doing it. So is there anything new that you're working on at the moment, any new books or any new programs that you've got coming up? Yeah, actually, I have one that I've been working on for um, the last nine months or so with, uh, with my colleague, Borg Fagerly, who's uh, very popular in Norway. Um, and it's, it's going to be called Superhuman Energy, and it's all about the science of optimizing energy levels. So a big focus of it is going to be on circadian rhythms, which is, you know, it relates to so many different things. It's a lot of people think here circadian rhythms and they think, oh, how many hours you sleep each night? And it's way, way bigger than that. Um, light exposure patterns, for example, are more important than the hours of sleep that you get each night. And then movement patterns, meal timing, nutrient timing, all of these things have a profound impact on circadian rhythms and in turn energy levels and, and energy levels is a, is kind of a, a new obsession of mine just cause I realize it's so integral to everything. I mean, it's in terms of a person's subjective well being and overall experience and quality of life, energy levels and mood are really at the core of that. And it's such a profound issue. And, uh, and, and there's so little good information out there on this subject. So, um, so Borg and I have, have basically been doing nothing but obsessing over the science for the last nine months. And just we're in constant back and forth over every new piece of research that we come across. And, and, uh, we've been writing this book and, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome stuff. I think it's going to be pretty revolutionary and really, um, put the science of energy levels out there in a way that's complete and get rid of all the BS and the pseudoscience and really make this a practical science based on real science. Nice. That, I mean, that sounds, sounds really cool. I mean, personally from kind of thinking about clients, like when you've got good energy, it's so much easier to then have better habits, to do more cooking, to decide that you want to go for a walk or to go to the gym or uh, to really look after yourself. And when you don't have good energy, it's so much more difficult. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, the, yeah exactly. The, the, the flip side of that is that when energy is, is bad, it's impossible almost to do anything. Um, it's impossible to get the motivation to do the right things to benefit your health or your body composition. Um, any aspect of self self care is basically going to be sabotaged if your energy is, is low. And yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, the more that I read and research and write about this subject, the more I realize that it really comes first, you know, all of the other habits that I, that I teach as far as, uh, movement habits and, and nutrition habits, people can only really do them well if that foundation of their energy level is in place first. And so I'm kind of reconceptualizing the way, the order that I teach all of my, my steps by putting that, you know, by putting energy as sort of the foundation. Here's the first step. This is key number one that everything else depends on. Yeah. And I guess a lot of the time when I'm working with people, and I know you mentioned kind of circadian rhythm, is that 
I'm like, we need to get your your sleep sorted out first because if you're sleeping really poorly, just the knock-on effect that that has in so many other areas is huge. And if you Absolutely. can be sorting that out, then it makes everything else so much easier um, to then move forward with. Yeah, absolutely. And if it's not in place, you know, I mean, I, I, for example, I did a one-on-one session with a a woman recently who, um, you know, she told me her best sleep that she gets every night is from 4am to 7am, but five days a week, she wakes up at 5am to go for a walk with her friend. (laughs) And, and she said, you know, I'm really struggling with insomnia and with, um, chronic fatigue, you know? can you help me? And I said, well, you know, you, you've already, you've already identified one issue. Your natural circadian rhythm is telling you that you need to sleep during this block of time, because that's when you intuitively get the best sleep and you are waking up two hours prior to that, you know, uh, and, and avoiding most of that chunk of time that you're saying you get the best sleep and going outside before sunrise and going for a walk with your friend. And she's like, well, you know, but, but, you know, that's the only time I have. And that's the only time my friend can do it. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm not in charge of your, you know, how your priorities, how you arrange your day, how your schedule is, et cetera. I, I can't affect those things. But what I can tell you is you're probably going to continue to experience these problems as long as you maintain the habit of not listening to your, to the cues you're getting from your body and, and having a proper circadian rhythm. And so, you know, there's, there's that balance. As long as you're not doing, uh, as, as long as you have poor circadian rhythm habits, you're probably going to sabotage everything else that you're doing as far as trying to improve your health or lose fat. Yeah. And that, and that is, is, definitely what i what i talk to people about and it is always the focus um if it's a problem with someone as like one of the first things that we need to sort out because of just the the trickle down effect yeah nice so look it's been really great to chat with you today ari um if people want to find out more about you uh, where should they go uh, they can go to my website, which is ariwitten.com. It's A-R-I-W-H-I-T-T-E-N. Okay. And, uh, and I offer a free fat loss test that they can take there along with a free ebook that will uh, go into a discussion of the specific factors that, are, that the test identified that are holding, uh, holding that person's fat loss efforts back. Awesome. Okay, Willow, it's been great chatting with you. Likewise. And yeah, hopefully hear more from you in the future. And yeah, really looking forward to the new book and the new program. Likewise. Great talking to you, Chris. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.sevensevenhealth.com.